Hi friends, welcome to Growing as Grown Ups, where we believe each of us has the opportunity to keep growing in ways that can fundamentally improve our life effectiveness, our leadership influence, and our well-being. Through interviews, stories, and practical principles, we explore how you can accelerate your growth and unlock your potential to make the difference you want to make. And now, your hosts from The Leaders Lyceum, Dr. Sarah Musgrove and Dr. Keith Eigel. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Growing as Grown Ups podcast. We are so excited that you are here for us, and I'm really excited about today's episode. We are bringing Keith's conversation with Kevin Riley, who is the editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, our hometown newspaper. And he is a guest that I had not interacted with before, and so I was just really surprised um, just at the stories he had to bring, the insights he had to share. I just, it was an awesome conversation. So Keith, do you want to tell us a little bit about Kevin? Yeah, I mean, Kevin is a uh, 40-year entire career, including college college work uh, a veteran of the newspaper industry. He's worked with Cox Media since 1983. He's been the editor of the AJC since 2011, as you said. He is, I mean, sir, it's a big, high profile role. Um, uh, editors take a lot of heat. They're in the paper themselves, some, or in, at least in the other news media themselves, some. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the thing I love about Kevin and as I always have loved about him is he's so approachable. Right. Yeah. And he's such a and he's such a great storyteller and he cares about people so much. And it's it's not like the old, uh, you know, who, uh, you know, like the old kind of cartoon editor that's going to bust him up and knock him down and, you know, in charge of the city. He's just he's so far from that. And yet the thing that I appreciated about our interview is just his thoughtfulness about how he leads and how he leads others and what's important in that. And you know, people will get to hear the story unfold as we get into this, but um, it was fun to hear him talk about it hadn't always been that way, yeah. right? That that earlier in his career, he was probably a little bit more about what he was accomplishing and all this kind of stuff. But folks, hang on. He's a fun person to listen to. Yeah, it's definitely worth staying, staying tuned for this one. So with that, let's get into your conversation with Kevin Riley from the AJC. We are so excited to have with us today, Kevin Riley, the editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution in my hometown of Atlanta, Georgia. Kevin, welcome to the Growing as Grownups podcast. Well, gosh, Keith, thanks for having me. It's good to, uh, good to be with you, and I'm looking forward to uh, this conversation. Same here, same here. Hey, um, you have been, I think, in the newspaper business for your entire career. Is that right? Pretty much, yeah. That's a that's a fair statement. Uh, you could, if you wanted to count my years in college, we're talking about four decades. So, wow, wow. Tell us a little bit about your about your journey through that industry, and and especially from a leadership perspective. Where have you Where have you been? We know where you are now, and I know that you you spent time running a paper up in Dayton, Ohio, and some things like that. But give folks a little bit of insight into into your story. Yeah, you know, um, you know, I don't know uh, how much people are interested in, but uh, I, I attended the University of Dayton uh, in Ohio. I grew up in Ohio in Cleveland, one of uh, six kids of a, a Cleveland, Ohio police officer. Uh, and um, so when I originally went away to school, my plan was to become a lawyer. And uh, I remember, I remember, uh, you know, I'd worked on the student newspaper in high school and I, I was working on the paper in college too. And I remember when I changed my mind and decided I wasn't going to go to law school, I was a sophomore sitting through this really boring political science class and said to myself, oh, my God, man, six more years of school. I'm never going to make it. I got to do something else. <laughs> so I ended up changing uh, uh, to journalism. Now, the reason I tell that story is because uh, I didn't go to a school with a big journalism school and with all of that um, uh, going on. So when I when I came out of school. And while I was in school, I, you know, I kind of felt that, you know, like maybe I wasn't as well prepared as I should be. Maybe I had no business, you know, thinking that I could do this thing. Um, and I, I, I think it gave me some, uh, some doubts as a leader. But one thing that helped me tremendously, uh, you know, I think about this all the time. And I've told this story to friends uh, 
because I wasn't in a big time journalism school where you had a lot of people interested in the field and a lot of people really working to make their way, my job at the uh, student newspaper was different than some of the people I've run into professionally, you know, uh, the, the things they experienced, it, it, meaning that a lot of people who were there were there voluntarily working on the student newspaper and there for fun. And they really weren't always getting class credits or anything like that. So it affected my leadership style because you couldn't, you had to be a little bit more persuasive, be a little bit more consensus building and in order to motivate people because you just couldn't order them around. And that has always stayed with me as a, as a leadership style that um, I would much rather, you know, convince people of what we need to do and why we need to do it rather than play the, you know, the, the authority game or order people around. Um, I think that that can cut two ways. There are times when a leader just has to say, here's what we need to do, you know, we're in a crisis. Um, but I also reflect upon that, I mean, uh, those college years, I had this really fantastic uh, professor in a writing class. And one of the things he said at the beginning of the class was, if you're gonna be a good writer, you're gonna do a lot of bad writing first. So let's get that out of the way. And I think leadership's the same. I think if you're gonna be a good leader, you're gonna be a bad leader first, maybe for a really long time. And that's how, how I feel about myself. Like, you know, there are things I did a couple of years ago that I think, why did I do it that way? You know, and, I, and it, it's just this idea that you gotta keep working at it. You have to be devoted to it. And I've had a lot of leadership experiences, even from a very young age, going all the way back to high school and places like that. And I think, yeah, he was pretty right about that. A lot of bad leadership in the Riley record, you know? And it gave me some pause coming on this podcast when we first, when we first talked, because I'm like, oh my God, someone who was victimized by that bad leadership is going to listen and they're going to really, they're going to send you a nasty note. I'm afraid of that, so. Yeah, did you, as you were um, in those early years, and I, I don't know how, I know from our conversations that we've had in other you know, over the past several years that um, you're always bumping up against stuff, right? But that, but that, that, um, that failure, you know, or bad leadership or whatever, you didn't use the word failure, but you gotta, you gotta do some things wrong to learn how to do it right. Was that, was that something that like you stayed up at night thinking about, or was it something that you feel like you incorporated um, fairly easily? I, you know, I think that there were times when I could incorporate it easily and then times when I was maybe too stubborn to realize that I, I needed to change. And I think it, uh, there was a moment I came to where I said, where I examined my motivation. Like why, there were, there were a couple moments, you know, where why do you want to be a leader? Why do you want to do this thing? What's motivating you, you know? And um, there were sort of two moments that came together for me on that fairly far apart, um, at least I would say, close to 10 years apart. That's how maybe a slow I was at learning some of these things. Uh, the first was at a very young age, my wife and I, um, we had just bought a new house. We had two young kids, another on the way. And I got, I was in Ohio uh, and I got the big job at a big newspaper. I got the offer, you know? And um, I had gone to the interview and pretty much agreed to take the job when I came home. And, uh, a few details to be worked out, not everything. And uh, my wife, you know, as we talked about it that weekend, she said, well, I'm not going. And I said, what? What do you mean you're not going? And it turned into a very difficult weekend long discussion, tearful at times, where she forced me to think about what was motivating me. And uh, the way I've described that now to my friends, it was at that moment that I realized, and I don't think I really put it this way, but I realized she was the CEO of our family. She was setting direction. She was the brains behind where we needed to go and why we needed to go there. And I was the chief operating officer of the family. And um, I think since that time, I had, again, I, I'm not even sure. I'd, I hope she's not overhearing me. I'm not sure she would enjoy hearing it that way, but it is true. Like her vision of what we were going to do and why we were going to do it was better than mine. And I was better at figuring out how we might get there and all the things that come with that, right? I mean, you know, you have a family and a lot of people do finances and all those things that you, you work your way through. She kept me from making a big, big mistake. So that was the first moment. And then 
years later, over a decade, I think, when my father died, it really, really was a moment for me. Now, for many of us, and I had a great relationship with my dad, and uh, for anyone who's close to their father, when their father dies, that's a big moment, a difficult moment. The thing, I have this wonderful story from his, his funeral that, I, that I'll tell if you're if there's anybody still listening, maybe I hope they enjoy this story. <laughs> I'm sure there are. <laughs> um, so again, I came from a big family, six kids. My dad was a cop uh, in the city of Cleveland for almost 30 years, knew a lot of people. And, uh, and at his funeral visitation, which was, I mean, it was in Cleveland, Ohio in January, snowing like crazy, you know, it was just... Uh, terrible day, people are lined up outside the door to come to that visitation. And so my mom insisted that all of her children stand there with her and greet people, like sort of a receiving line. And so as each people were making their way up through the line, one of us knew who they were if my mom didn't. So we could say, oh, hey, mom, this is, you know, so-and-so, I work with them, you know. But there's this guy coming up through the line and none of us recognize him. And we're kind of looking around, you know, we're all very close and kind of panicking a little like who is this guy so he comes up to my mom and we're like I got nothing you know I don't know who this guy is and he says to her you don't know who I am and uh, he proceeds to tell her I'm here because your husband arrested me many many years ago and he helped me get my life back on track wow <laughs> and he said I just wanted to say thank you oh my gosh and the reason I tell that story is because I, at that, <clears throat> excuse me, at that moment, I thought I would love to have anybody say something like that to me or about me someday. And from that moment on, I was a different leader. Wow. What was the takeaway? I mean, I think people can put some of these pieces together, but what was the, what did you learn new about you in that moment? I think that what we have to recognize as leaders is what what is motivating us and if that motivation is our self-satisfaction and our achievements we're on a perilous path that will inevitably lead to disappointment if our if our motivation is much more the possibilities and those that we work with the possibilities for our own learning our possibilities for um, what can be accomplished you know when a when a leader really draws people out into what, what they are motivated by and love to do and can do and uh, wanna grow, then, then you're on to something. And the reason for that is um, when you look at it that way, disappointments and shortcomings aren't really failures. They're just along the way, you know? And I started accomplishing so much more in my career at that point I was so much happier because it wasn't about the next thing I could get done or the next job I would get, you know, and that combined with that episode with my wife, where we, we had made a decision at that point, I wasn't going to chase after getting a big media job in some big market because we were going to have a life where we had other things that, that motivated us. And um, of course, what happened, I ended up with a big job in Atlanta, which is about as big a place as I could ever have imagined being, because I quit worrying about it, <laughs> if that makes any sense. And so I think that the, there's a lot to be said for asking yourself what motivates you as a leader? What is it that is central to what you're trying to get to? And if it's, um, you know, Pat Lenzacone in his, one of his uh, latest books, I know you're a fan, that's the five dysfunctions of a team guy sure. talks about that. I think the book is called the motive and uh, he literally has like a little Q and a in it and everything. But I think that uh, if, if what we, if what we search for and most, what is most attractive to us are those rewards or perks or trappings of leadership, whatever you'd like to call them, that eventually um, that's not going to be enough, that there's got to be some really core motivation. And so that day I thought, man, I would love for someone to think that way about me. <laughs> wow. What an amazing story. Yeah. Um, the, uh, how old were you about ish? Let's see. My dad died. I'll do the quick math in my head. I was about 41 or two, I'm about 40 ish. I, I mean, I could get the calendar out, but I'm pretty sure that's very close. 
And, so that's and, how long it took me. I had three kids. I'd been married for a long time. I mean, I'm kind of embarrassed that it took me that long, especially when I reflect on all the leadership opportunities I had in big and small ways. I was the worst high school baseball team captain I could have possibly been, <laughs> you know, but what an opportunity, you know, to be the captain of the baseball team. But when you're only thinking about yourself, it, 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 it was a bad season, man. It was a frustrating season. And are you telling me, I mean, I don't want you to rat yourself out too bad here, but are you telling me that for 20 years, the early part of your career, that the motivation was more about like the achievement than it was about others and that, that that's the switch that flipped for you? I would say yes. Um, and, and I don't want to, I, I mean, I hope, uh, but I guess suppose others would answer this question better. I, I don't mean that, you know, I was blindly ambitious, just rolling over people and not caring about them. At least I don't think I was, but I'll bet you I made some people feel that way. You know, I'll bet that because when you're thinking more about yourself as a leader than others, you're in trouble, you know, you really are. And I think we're going to probably get to this in a conversation, but during these times of this pandemic, man, has that become clear to me that you, you got to do all you can for the people you lead. I mean, you have to pay attention to yourself and you have to know what you must accomplish as a leader. I mean, that, that's all. I mean, those are all givens, right? We all have tremendously demanding jobs as leaders, results we just have to get, results we sometimes don't reach and are disappointed and frustrated by, of course. But uh, it's, it's, the, it's the people for whom you're responsible, the people to, who are looking to you for leadership that you really have to think about and do the best you can for at all times. I believe, I mean, that's where I've come to. Yeah. I love that, Kevin. I mean, it is, um, that is a, that is a conclusion that a number of people never draw. Um, it's a conclusion that um, most people who ultimately draw it wish they had drawn it earlier. Right. But I wish I'd done it sooner. I mean, you know, I'm familiar with your work and I'm going to guess at least some people who listen, you know, in terms of these levels of leadership and, and all of that stuff that, you know, um, I've, I've learned from, from getting to know you. Um, and I just, you know, it's one of those things I realized about my dad, you know, he was a very high level leader, even though he was a frontline cop and detective his virtually his whole career, he was never the commissioner of police or the or the captain of the homicide squad or anything like that. But he was definitely the leader of his family and a, and a leader, you know. Um, and that is, a, again, when you come to, the, you know, it's, again, when it, when it finally hits you, and I'm going to guess a lot of the people you work with would say this, it's like so obvious. And you're like, why did it take me so long to see that, you know? Yeah, it's, it's amazing, though, there is a, um, so there are a couple of things that I'm hearing in the story. I mean, one is this shift from sort of from outside in to inside out, right, allowing the things around you to define success for you. Um, but, but that, that moment and, the, and, and for so many people, the loss of a, a key parent, one of their parents, both of their parents, either of their parents is such a defining moment for them. It's a point of reflection. I think, I don't know when the last time we talked, but I lost my dad about um, 18 months, two years ago, something along those lines. And, um, and just the shift, the shift that takes place over time is a real shift. But, but it's a, but even though it's over time, it's a compressed period of time compared to just letting life unfold. It's too, it's too, it's too constant a challenge, too constant a restructuring of how we're making sense of things. And man, that story is, is, is powerful. And to know that it was kind of a boom, I want someone to say that about me. That's a, that's a big, um, that's a big, that's a big point. That's a big inflection point. And, um, you know, one of the main reasons that we're doing this podcast is that we think when people understand that the, a big part of their working year's journey is moving from the outside in to the inside out, and that, and that this is what maturity looks like. This is what 
growing as a grown up looks like, right? That we that we begin to author and take ownership of who we're going to be. Um, that we can accelerate others' progress on that journey by getting them to intentionally focus on it. I mean, that's honestly that's the whole reason for this podcast is that in a in a weird way you were lucky enough to have something happen to you that flipped the switch. Yeah, and and part of what affects me is uh, in the end it comes down to a couple obviously key people in my life, right? My wife, my my father. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll try this, too, for the sake of people who are listening and trying to grow as leaders. I think some of what I'm saying, right, about, you know, kind of being in service to people who work for you and really caring about them and loving them and trusting them, you know, that can sound a little too touchy-feely for some people. Like, But, you know, I'm about getting stuff done. I'm not about, you know, making people feel good. I'm about results. I mean, we've all, we, all, we all know that reality of the workplace and leadership, whether it's in an intense corporate environment, or if, if it's in your personal life, I mean, you know, what's the point if you're not getting something done? Um, I think that it's just really, really important to, to remember that you have to do hard things and do them well. And I'm going to give you an example. And this is a, this is a tough one, Keith. And, and, and I don't know when we, we do the re-listen to the podcast, maybe I won't want you to include it. But, you know, I work in an industry, newspapers, that has faced a lot of financial challenge and turmoil. I've been in a position where I've had to lay people off, uh, a lot of people. I mean, I, 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 I don't even want to count, but it's a lot. And this is going to sound crazy and might sound um, insensitive, but I've really worked hard to get better at it, you know? Um, and I've talked to people about that and people I've worked with who, who I've learned from, because look, if you're a young inexperienced leader who's not working to have this perspective that, that you need, what's worse than, you know, what's worse than having to tell someone they don't have a job anymore? I mean, that's in the workplace, that's the, that is the ultimate difficulty, whether it's happening to someone, which is the worst, or if it's someone, you are someone to whom you are delivering that message, you know. Um, and I think that you go through stages of that too, right? I mean, who wants to wake up? It's, it's sort of part of your theory. You grow through these difficult moments. Who wakes up in the morning and says, you know, I'd like to lay some people off today. I think that'd be a good experience for me, you know. I mean, no normal person is going to do that, and we are filled with dread and the need to escape that fate. I mean, all those things are so human. I mean, if you, if you don't want to avoid laying someone off, I mean, you're not human, right? But you have to do it. I've had to do it. And it's been awful. And what, I, what I've learned is you go through, I don't know if I'd call them stages. I'd love to study this. I'd love to find someone who does work like you to study this. But, at, you know, the first time you do it, or at first, you kind of want to talk yourself into it, like somehow people deserve this, like somehow they had it coming because you've got to steal yourself to deliver that news. And that's the wrong way to think about it. Right. And you know, you're not a tough guy. You're not doing the hard things because you do this. This is like a terrible moment and you've got, and so, and you've got to fulfill your responsibilities as a leader. Right. Well, I think you do that with compassion and with thought and with honesty. Um, and I've just sort of learned one of the greatest moments I had in my entire career was I had a person I laid off and during their final couple of days come into my office and, and thank me for how it was handled. I appreciate that you handled it this way, that you said these things. And now, I don't think the line of people who would say that to me is very long. I don't wanna give people the wrong idea because again, this is not some self-congratulatory thing when you lay people off, but I think it's really important to know that if you are gonna be centered on the people who work for you and caring about them, that does not mean you, you, you avoid difficult decisions or difficult things, but it fundamentally changes how you approach them. These are people with lives and stories and cares and worries. And if you have to tell them they're not going to have a job, think about how you tell them. Think about what they deserve to know, when they deserve to know it, how they deserve to be treated, all of those things. And those moments, I think, have made me a better leader but I never, you know, I've never gotten over having to do that. I can, I can see almost every person, you know? Yeah. It is almost impossible for me right now to not be reflecting on how much you might be like your dad was 
and and is there why why the why the guy who came up at his memorial service right and what was the spirit that your dad must have had for someone to move into that i'm i'm grateful not it's different than grateful for being arrested i've heard people tell that story before i've never heard them call out the person who did the arresting but there must have been some sense of compassion some sense of this is about it, it, it's about this person and their life and their story there must there must have been something there in that well, um, i hope you're i don't right. know if i'm reading too i don't know if i'm reading too much in between the lines but that that sense of knowing that it's not just about you is actually a very elevated way to construct meaning around leadership and you know in the most transactional way in that relationship with that man your father was the leader R right i mean he had his job to do he was in charge it was going down the way he wanted it to go down and he chose a way that i mean again i don't want to read too much into that story but it's it, it is um there, there had to have been something about him. Well, you know, it's kind of funny because one of the things that <laughs> has been on a little bit of a parallel track and is almost, uh, you know, kind of silly, but I'll tell this story too. Um, you know, when uh, uh, I see my parents' old friends, which is pretty rare, they, they will always say, oh my God, you look just like your dad. And it used to really make me angry because my dad's a lot shorter than I was. I, you know, I mean, I... I feel like I'm in better shape than he was, you know, all those things like, you know, you don't want to be just like your dad. Right. And what's changed me over this recently is I, I, I accept it as a huge compliment, not, you know, not just because of what I think you're seeing and, and I may, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm putting a lot into this, but also what it is, is they see him in me. Yeah. 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 And that, and could there be a better compliment, you know? Right, right. No, there can't be. It's not just the gray hair and the double chin and all the other things that come along with looking like him, I suppose, you know? <laughs> yeah. So as you think about all of these past experiences that have, that have shaped you, right? And if we went back and talked about story after story, some of them big, some of them small, my, I would... I would propose that th there was an element of challenge in almost every one of those stories, right? I mean, you and I have talked about this plenty, but, but, but what happens is the first time we need to lay someone off, the first time we experience something, a lot of times our existing lens, the way we see the world, the way we're making sense of things is challenged by a new circumstance, by the loss of somebody, by the loss of something, by a change in position and that lens no longer makes perfect sense and that's an opportunity for growth right and so when we go back and have people tell stories of you know we don't even have to use the word challenge we can just say key or landmark times in your past and people wind up recalling times of challenge nobody talks about the time that they we're laying on the beach for an entire spring break in 1980, whatever, 1990, whatever. And all they did was they read this great book. Nope. That doesn't come up on anybody's sort of key events lifeline, right? It's always the hard stuff that come. If you got arrested on spring break in 1980, whatever. Yeah. Then it Is comes there up. something you want to reveal to the audience? You keep bringing up this. Spring break. <laughs> I have never been arrested on spring break. So, um, <laughs> But That's yeah, you're right. I mean, it's the truest thing in the world, right? And again, something I've, you know, we've talked about, which is uh, if you have a room of 100 people and you ask them what the most important or significant thing they've ever done, 99 of them will recount something very, very difficult. And, um, you know, it, it, it plays out in so many ways uh, in the real world of, of life and in the workplace, because it's just, you're not human if you're not looking to avoid <laughs> difficult moments like I you know it's kind of like we talked about the layoff thing um you know no one wakes up wanting to do that and then is struggling through it and, and and you talk about lens you know you use that word like when you can shift it and say it's really about these people 
that this is happening to you mm-hmm. know what i mean or that i as a leader have to deliver this message to that that changes everything that changes how you think about it, it changes your approach but um it's not and there are so many things like that right i mean as you're pointing out it's just it's those hard what seem like impossible moments that change you yeah um Hey, let me shift gears for us a little bit. When you think about, I mean, we're, we, we just put a wrap on 2020. It's January 25th um, when we're recording this and uh, the new year has started. I think people are hopeful for, for some change. But when you think about everything that's going on in your world right now, um, what, what's the, what's, what do you see as the thing you're bumping up against today? What's the biggest challenge? What do you imagine if you look back 10 years from now, you will say are the landmark key events about this, about this time period. Yeah. So let me, you know, I'll kind of go really big picture and then try to bring it, you know, more more narrowly focused to my situation. But, and I just think we're living through a time in the country where the media, you know, obviously the work I do is extremely challenged uh, for all kinds of reasons. Um, Much of it having to do with credibility and presence and, you know, all those things where we're trying to uh, earn the right and earn the trust of people to believe in what we're doing, right? And um, I think you have to do that every minute of every day. And there are a lot of forces working against you. You have to have the courage of your convictions and the confidence in in what you're trying to uh, report and try to information you're trying to bring to people. You know, we don't want to lose track of each other because all you really have in this world I work in is the people who do the work you know, and it's their commitment to it and their sense that they, they are, they are, they are just so dedicated. We, this, this readership of ours, our, our public, this city, this state has to be informed about what's going on. We just, every day we want to make sure they know. And if that makes the mayor angry or the governor angry, you know, okay. But if people don't know what's going on, they can't live effective lives. They can't be safe. They can't be well-informed. They can't make good decisions. And that's what we're trying to do, you know, and it's, uh, it's been challenging and I've been amazed by people's commitment and some of the work that, that we've accomplished. And it's really, it's really been, um, and it, and it hasn't slowed down, you know, there's no end in sight. So we're, yeah. people are pretty tired out. When, uh, earlier, uh, you know, a few minutes ago, you used, um, the word, the courage of your convictions, um, and um, the, the intentionality with which you lead, the intentionality with which you think through things has always impressed me in all of our conversations. But, but when you have to bump up against, w- when the courage of your convictions are in some ways going against the grain or what you perceive to be as going against the grain, What's the, what's the thing in you at this stage in your life that you're bumping up against? What's the, we use the term worry, fear, or resistance a lot in the work that we do, that, that we need to identify that thing that we're trying to keep from happening in order to realize this new way of understanding, this new us, this, this continually growing person. Is it, is it easy for you to know what you're bumping up against or what you need to bump up against to keep growing at this stage? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think it's never easy. I, I mean, I guess I lack a certain self-awareness, you know, I, I mean, uh, because um, I, I, I never seem to see things clearly until I have a little distance and, and I wish I were smarter and more perceptive, you know, um, than that. But I mean, when I feel... What I feel when you, when you were talking about that, what was coming to mind is, so I live in this world of, of newspapering, right? Where we know that what a newspaper does for, for all of its flaws is, is, is crucially important. We, we hold people accountable. We inform the public. We, we do these things, but our financial model is broken, right? And we've seen newspapers around the country go under and we've seen all of that. And, and what I've got to do is keep making what we do valuable, you know, as the leader and depending on the people who work for me to the people of Atlanta and Georgia until we get to some place where there's a, you know, where it's a purely digital play or where there is a new economic model. Because if we give up, if we slip, if we don't let that happen, it will be a great loss to 
I believe, great loss to the community. Um, what I want people to feel about us is the way they feel about a lot of other institutions like a university or a children's hospital or an art museum, where it's like, this is part of the fabric. We need this thing to be who we are as a community. And even though we make people angry and, and there's a lot of divisiveness, um, there's still also a lot of support for what we do, a lot of attaboys, especially during this, this period. And that's what I want people, that's, that gets me up every day, man. <laughs> No, Kevin, if I were living under that pressure, I think I could make a pretty immediate long list of worry, fear, and resistance. <laughs> well, you know, if I wasn't spending all night trying to sleep, I would be maybe making that list, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. I, I love that. Um, and it's hard, you know, because, um, you know, during the pandemic uh, in Georgia, I mean, one of the things we have done has been very demanding of the governor in our reporting, right? And when the governor calls a press conference to literally criticize the work of, of the newspaper, of people who work for you, you know, I mean, like the guy, the folks writing those stories are at the very press conference he has called to talk about how terrible their stories are, right? I mean, that's a, that's a demanding thing. And people need to feel from me and from a lot of other places that someone's behind them, that, okay, we'll let the governor do that and we'll be back at work again tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, just because of time. Um, I know I'm carrying you know, on here. I'm sorry. You didn't no, know. gosh, it's <laughs> it's so good. People who may be in their late twenties, into their thirties, you know, walking walking the about to walk the journey that you've already walked. What what advice do you have? What do you think are some of the key pieces? for folks who want to keep growing, want to have influence, want to make a difference uh, in the ways that they do. Looking back now, what do you, what would you, what would you say to them? Um, wow, there's so many things. Um, the first would be patience. You know, I think that we're all, especially when we're young, we're impatient. Um, we some, we, we're measuring ourselves against the progress other people are making or the what someone said in the alumni newsletter about a friend or a colleague, you know, that <laughs> that can be a trap. Um, I say this uh, to people all the time. You are most likely to hear the things that you most need to hear from a person you would least like to hear it from. <laughs> and I think about that all the time now, like bosses I didn't like and, you know, people like that. And, and even, even though, um, you know, I, I, I very believe I'm very different from some of those bosses. I still heard things from them that, that um, I, you know, have stuck with me and needed to stick with me. Um, you know, I think young leaders, I do, I do this, I have this conversation when I do some of the uh, workshops and stuff I've been asked to do at the newspaper for Cox. Um, you know, by the time you get to your first leadership job, you know, your first frontline manager job, you have reached the point of almost zero good feedback from anyone, <laughs> you know, um, and, and here's what I mean. Um, you know, I'll do this little exercise where I'll, I'll, I'll take two people in a group, you know, when we're having this conversation who I know, know each other, you know, and I'll say, Hey, Keith, tell Kevin just one thing, one really simple thing. I know you guys are friends that he could do. That would be that would be better than what he's doing now or would improve you know just any it could be anything personal professional the way he dresses anything and people cannot do it and i then i'll always say you see what i mean like this is a safe environment you guys are friends it's a simple thing and you can't quite because it's just so hard to tell someone something you know they don't want to hear like hey kevin really get a better haircut you know um and I point that out because if you have someone, and I don't care who it is, it could be your spouse, could be a brother, could be a coworker, could be you know your priest, it could be anybody who is willing to come to you and say, you know, you're screwing this up or you're you're not doing a good job. You know what the first words out of your mouth have got to be? Thank you, thank you. Especially if that person's a subordinate, because the first time a leader reacts poorly. The signal's there. Don't tell him anything he doesn't want to hear. You know what I mean? We, and we know that guy, right? We all know that person. And it is so hard in that moment. Because, you know, back to your point about facing difficulty or challenge. 
who the heck wants to hear anything bad about themselves? I mean, you're not human. Anyone who says, oh, I like, you know, good, strong feedback about how I can, improve, that's BS. No one likes that unless they're yeah. not human. But if you can weather the storm and in that moment where you feel like I'm going to argue, like you kind of come out of your chair a little bit, you're going to you're going to argue with this person because they're not seeing it the way they should. But instead, if you can stop yourself and say, Keith, thank you. Thank you, man. I'm sure it was hard for you to come in here and say that. Let's talk a little bit more or give me some time to think about it. And I'm going to come back. If you're having like, if you have a bad temper, like me, you have a little trouble controlling, you know, your anger when someone tells you those three things. I th if you could, if you can find someone who'll actually tell you stuff you want to hear, that's like so precious, you know, uh, it's unbelievably precious. Yeah. Oh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And you're on the same page. I don't think I can quote it directly, but Emerson um, said something along the lines, um, have you, only learned lessons. Have you only learned great lessons from those who have loved you, been tender with you, and stood aside for you? Have you not also learned great lessons from those who have disputed passage with you? Yeah. And 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 that's the idea, right? It's like it's 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 as hard as it is in the moment to say thank you, to realize that even if they're wrong they're giving you something in the courage of deciding they are gonna say something to you. Um, you know what, thank you for sharing part of your life with this audience. It's just, it's so, it's so much fun for us to get to just interview and hear stories from people who have accomplished a lot, right? And, and, that, and, that, and that I know you'd be the first person to say this, but um, people who've accomplished a lot are normal people who have challenges, who have struggles, who sometimes don't know what to do, but it's in the battling through that, that, that um, it, refines, it refines what they bring to the table. Yeah, and, and what's important for me, and you know, especially for people who are listening, obviously people in Atlanta, I hope they read and subscribe to the newspaper and continue to support us because uh, we need you, of course, and we would like you to do that. But I also, it's important for people to know these folks who work in the media, and just take me as an example in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, we're regular people, we're normal. We have these, these opportunities, these struggles, these life journeys, we're your neighbors, we're, we're your friends, we, you know, we may be the people you go to church with or your kids go to school with. And um, it's these things that can, you know, the media can be demonized or talked about in the abstract, but it's real people doing real work out there doing their best, trying to yeah. make sure that the people who, uh, to whom, you know, they are important or to whom they give time are, are well informed. And um I hope we're doing the best possible job that we can. And I just want, would want people to know I am very committed to it and hope that they sense that. Yeah. Um, and I have to tell you, under the, the paper under your leadership, um, not to diminish anything in the past, um, I've just so appreciated the approach uh, that you guys have taken. I know credible, compelling, and complete is um, kind of the tagline that I get to hear all the time, but it's so true. Um, and I appreciate that. I'm assuming that's one of the main things you're most excited about in your life. And I do, I would encourage people, it's my online daily read newspaper, catch up what's going on in our community. And I'm assuming they just go to AJC.com. That's where I go, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And yeah. um, uh, obviously they can still get the paper delivered at home. They can get the uh, PDF replica version of the paper online or to their iPad or another device. Um, but yeah, we like people to subscribe, whether they do it digitally or uh, in print, because that's, uh, that's crucial to supporting us. Um, anything else? How can people, how can people find you? You're on Twitter. Do you have uh, lots of uh, I, um, social media yeah. handles that I'm not very familiar with? I'm AJC editor, both on Facebook and on Twitter. You can okay. find me there. Um, I uh, try to stay pretty active, but I don't like to invite too much of the craziness on social media. Um, and I encourage people to actually, you know, if they have a choice, go to our site or read the paper, because uh, if you're getting if you're getting your news only through your social media feed, you're really you're really not treating yourself well. You need to have some good news sources that you go to to make sure you're well informed. Oh, it's so good, Kevin. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for carving a window out for us and for this audience to get to just hear. So appreciate it. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks for having me.
Absolutely. Well, um, we will look forward to seeing you soon. And folks, I'm serious. If you, um, even if you're not in the Atlanta area, the Atlanta Journal Constitution is um, kind of my go to source. It's one of my favorite reads. And I just, it feels so balanced. It feels right. So I appreciate the work you do, the leadership for our city. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, folks, I hope you enjoyed this. I did. Wow, Keith, what a fun conversation. And, and like you said, Kevin is just so, he's so approachable. And as somebody that I know is in such a influential and high stakes job, he really does seem like somebody who's so down to earth and so open. And just, I mean, even starting with the story he tells about his dad and, and the emotion that he let show through that was just so amazing. and. And I just loved it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, like I said at the beginning of this, uh, before the interview, it's a tough position. It's a hard nosed position to be in. And yet he's got, I, I brought this up in the interview, but he must have some level of that same compassion or, or his father must have had some of that same compassion that we got to see in Kevin and through his stories, you know, and um, it was just so, it, just so good. But, you know, here we are another another episode of Growing as Grown-Ups podcast with someone who has achieved a lot and it's not all smooth sailing, right? I mean, just the right. challenges that he faced um, earlier in his career. Um, I love the story about his wife and that he decided <laughs> she was the CEO of the house that she could set the direction. And once he got the direction, he knew what to do with it. All that, I, I, I loved all of that. Yeah. I think one thing I the- really really loved about his interview and and we don't know his personality type. I know we've re- referenced that on a couple of the episodes, but I get the sense that he might be wired a little bit like me and the recognition that having to have hard conversations and make difficult decisions. He talked a couple of times about having to lay people off and how nobody wants to do that. Right. And, and there may be some people in the world that it's not a big deal for them, but it would, it would be hard for me and just the reframing he brings to it of like, you know, I have to do this. How do I do this in a way Mm. that is going to be best for the person I'm leading? How do I stay centered on the person that I'm leading in a way that like people have thanked him for that. And I, you know, I've seen it happen once in life where somebody thanked a person for delivering hard news. And it's just like, man, that, that's just such a great reminder of leadership, right? That it is, it is not only about doing the hard things, but doing the hard things in a way that the people that you are leading will be better for them on the other side. Yeah. And do you know, I I love the way uh, toward the end of the interview, he actually flipped that idea about um, how are you going to make it easy for people to tell you hard stuff? Oh, yeah. Right. And just, and, and, and if you find those people in your life, and, and I, I, think I, I think I wrote it down. I said, um, and I may have this slightly wrong because this is in my handwriting. You may have the transcript, Sarah, but you are most likely to hear the thing you most need to hear from the person you would least like to hear it from, Ouch. right? And I know, but when you get it, say thank you, right? I mean, that, okay. that whole idea of it's so difficult. The thing that even in his SFE, feel, at least feeler sort of way, he 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 was, he was able to say, he was able to put himself in the shoes of the person who has to give the feedback and how difficult that is for people. So always start with thank you, even if you want to bow up. Right. <laughs> right. right. I mean, that's just a great exercise. Um, I mean, there was just, there were so many other things. Another quote that I wrote down that I loved is when you're thinking about yourself when you're thinking more about yourself as a leader than others, you're in trouble. So again, just such a servant leadership, follower centered leadership strategy that you would think in an industry like his, you know, you, you got to be more thick skinned and he even acknowledged other people think it's touchy feely, but really it is just the best way to lead, at least for the way he's wired and the, the people he's leading. So uh, I loved it. Yeah. And it's just for me, it was another um, interview 
another of many of all these high achieving people who have been on the Growing as Grown Ups podcast that that um, that that there it's real people stories right it's stuff that all of us face but one of the things that i kind of liked about kevin's interview his dad's loss was a landmark huge landmark mm -hmm. story right but uh, but a lot of the things that he brought up were just things that somebody said to him that bothered him a little bit or 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 these different things and 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 this ability to not be afraid of looking at yourself Right, not be afraid to think, what could I be learning new here? Why am I resistant to this? All of that kind of stuff is just sort of interlaced, but not in like the big story moment, except for the big aha around his father. Yeah. Um, but again, just really brilliant. And his um, his his advice, even his advice to people, um, you know, when you can, when you can find the person who will tell you the thing you don't want to hear, that's so precious, right? I don't know yeah. that anybody else has said precious in an interview, but it was, be <laughs> it was beautifully said. So I don't, anything else stand out at you, Sarah? And if not, we'll let the folks go pretty soon. No, I mean, those are, those were my big takeaways. Just the, the follower centeredness of his leadership is great. Yep. I loved it. I loved it. Um, folks, if you want to learn more about things we have to get you on the journey, go to growinggrownups.com, not growingasgrownups.com, but growinggrownups.com and just start with the growth gap tool. Start with some of the things. We've got courses on there to take you down this journey to get you to the place that you want to be where you can kind of own the difference that you want to make. Yep. We hope to see you there. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Growing as Grownups. Take a second and subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any future episodes and tell your friends. You'll find all of the goods related to this episode, including the transcript, videos, links, and other ways we can help you keep growing as a grown-up on our website, growinggrownups.com. Growth isn't easy, but it's completely within your reach. Until next time, journey well, friends.